Hello, my name is Valerie Pierre, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Today, we will be talking about altered mental status. But first, why do I love emergency medicine? I love emergency medicine because I like taking care of all patients, regardless of their background or chief complaint. I love that I'm trained in a specialty that gives me the opportunity to take care of any acuity level of patient care. And I love that I'm capable of being able to save someone's life in any emergent situation. My interests in this field are diversity, equity, inclusion, point of care ultrasound, and medical education. So today, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to define the ABCs of resuscitation, identify how to rapidly manage an unstable patient with altered mental status, and develop a broad differential for a patient with altered mental status. But first, what is altered mental status? So it's a pretty catch-all term for a change in someone's baseline mental status due to an underlying condition. It's a very common chief complaint in the emergency department, representing about 5% of all ED presentations. It is very important to have a broad differential when seeing these patients as a lot of times they don't read the textbook and more than one thing can be happening simultaneously. As you can see, altered mental status can also vary upon a continuum of terms um, from confusion, delirium, lethargy, obtundation, and coma. And finally, if you've watched the news, I'm sure you've heard the term of agitated or excited delirium. It's an often misused term that does not have a true medical or psychiatric diagnosis. It is often characterized by agitation, aggression, acute distress, and sudden death, often in the pre-hospital setting. So what do you do when you first see a patient with altered mental status? You assess the patient's one-liner, as I call it. The one-liner is their age, their chief complaint, their general appearance, and their vital signs. So the vital signs that we typically talk about are the blood pressure, heart rate, core temperature, pulse oxygen, saturation, respiratory rate, and don't forget the finger stick blood glucose, especially for altered mental status. So once again, when you first see a patient with altered mental status come into your ED, you want to know their age, their chief complaint, their general appearance, and their vitals, and you don't want to forget their finger sick blood glucose. So another thing you should do when you first assess the patient is assess their primary survey, also known as the ABCs. So the ABCs stand for airway, breathing, and circulation. And what you wanna do is you, like I said, first thing is A, so you always wanna make sure that this patient is secure in their airway, which is very important when dealing with patients with altered mental status, because if they cannot protect their airway, then you need to secure their airway. And that's before you move on to breathing and circulation. So protecting their airway means that they are able to have the mental status enough to breathe on their own in a safe manner at a proper rate, typically between like 12 to 20 and breaths per minute that they can basically, like I said, protect their own airway because their mental status is enough to do so. And if they can't do that and you determine that, then you need to secure the airway. Typically we do that by intubation. So next, once you make sure that they're securing their airway, you check their breath sounds. So you also look at how they're breathing. Are they tachypnic with a fast respiratory rate, bradypnic, low or slow respiratory rate, um, are they having retractions, which is uh, accessory muscle use? And how are their breath sounds? Is it clear to auscultation bilaterally? Do they have strider, ronchi, uh, rawls, or practice? And then circulation. Typically, I'll fill for their radial pulses and feel, is it one plus, two plus, bounding? Um, are their pulses weak and thready? And so forth. A lot of times you'll hear people say A, B, C. IVO2 monitor. What that means is when they're assessing their airway, they're also looking to say, well, this patient might need IV access because they might need more medications. 
So IV stands for making sure the patient also has IV access. Many times you'll hear people say two large bore IVs, like a 16 or 18 gauge in the anticubital fossa. When they say O2, they mean provide the patient with supplemental oxygen. Many times that will be nasal cannula, non-rebreather, and so forth. And then when they say monitor, it means to make sure we put the patient on a cardiac monitor so we can get repeat vitals pretty quickly. So what if you have a patient that's not stable uh, or critically ill or they look sick and they're coming in with altered mental status? You wanna quickly stabilize that patient, right? So I like to use the mnemonic DON'T. DON'T stands for dextrose, oxygen, Narcan or thymine. And these are quick, easy things that you can do to reverse their unstable status and hopefully make them more stable and less altered. So if you have a patient that's coming in and maybe appears like they're having stroke-like symptoms, um, like some focal neurological deficits, or they're just very sleepy or confused, like I said, you want to make sure you check that finger stick. If their finger stick is less than 60, and the patient's over eight years old, you can give them D50. And typically we'll ask our nurses to give one or two amps of D50. If their ultra mental status is secondary to hypoglycemia and the, uh, you give dextrose, you'll often see the a change in their mental status pretty quickly. Um, so dextrose is the first part of the don't mnemonic. Then oxygen. So if the patient appears to um, be tachypnic or you notice that their pulse ox is less than 92% and they're a bit confused or altered, giving them supplemental oxygen might reverse that. So you can give it via nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula, a non-rebreather. Um, you can give it through BiPAP or CPAP um, or end tidal, uh, or sorry, ET tube and you want to see that their pulse, uh, sorry, oxygen saturation is greater than 92%. Um, also, you have to remember that patients of color, a lot of times their pulse ox may not be accurate. And there's some studies that came out recently that have shown that. Also, patients who might be wearing nail polish, uh, you might not get an accurate pulse ox read. So think that if you have a patient that, that is, uh, appears to be having some respiratory distress and is altered, and a patient of color and their pulse ox is reading like 84%, keep in mind that it actually might be lower. And this is notable, especially during the COVID pandemic and sometimes determines treatment and things like that. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you have a patient that comes in with a slow respiratory rate, let's say six breaths per minute, and they have pinpoint or constricted pupils, uh, think about giving them Narcan. That patient might be having an opioid overdose. And a lot of times, once you give the Narcan, you'll see a very quick change in their mental status and their, their respiratory status as well. And then finally, excuse me, if you have a patient that's coming in with um, possibly something related to alcohol intoxication or alcohol abuse disorder, uh, you might see them be altered as well. And giving thiamine and folic acid may help to reverse some of the issues, especially if it's due to Wernicke's Corsica. But if you're suspicious of alcoholic ketoacidosis, then you wanna make sure you give the folic acid and thiamine before glucose. And that's important to know for boards or shelf exams. So once again, if you're concerned about alcoholic ketoacidosis, make sure you give the thiamine and folic acid before glucose. So once again, don't. Dextrose for um, ultramental status that might be secondary to hypoglycemia oxygen for ultra mental status that might be related to respiratory distress or hypoxia, Narcan for opioid overdose, and thiamine and folic acid for alcohol intoxication or something secondary to one of these. Uh, as you guys learned in medical school in those earlier years, your history and physical exam is very, very important and a lot of times can clue you in on what's going on with a patient. So we're gonna talk now about the HPI and secondary survey. So mnemonic that I like to use for HPI is PAM hugs FOSS. What that stands for is past medical history, allergies, current medications, hospitalizations, urinary symptoms, GI symptoms, sleep symptoms or sleep history, family history, 
OBGYN history, sexual history, and social history. So a lot of times if a patient is coming in with altered mental status, you probably won't be able to get that much information from them. So this is where you guys as med students, um, you guys can really shine on your team because you can collect collateral information and you can get that from EMS um, by doing chart review and often looking at the demographics tab. You can get contacts for family members and or friends and reach out to them and get more history or even reach out to the social worker with that information or just saying, hey, we need more collateral information. Can you help me get that? And the more information you can get about a patient's background when dealing with someone who's coming in with altered mental status, like I said, it can really clue you into having a better and uh, differential and figuring out what is going on with that patient and why you know, they're experiencing their symptoms. So this is something I still use um, quite often and it's also helpful for boards, uh, like oral boards studying for the exam, knowing the questions to ask to get the history that you need to help you with your diagnosis. So remember, Pam hugs Foss. And the second part of that that's really important is having a very, um, very head to toe uh, exam. So we call that the secondary survey when you're doing that head to toe, uh, really full physical exam, not limited, but full, especially once again, for a patient with altered mental status, when you do not know what is going on with them. So you'll see this, this is called the homunculus. And a lot of times like we use this for oral boards as well too. Um, but it just kind of reminds you to go head to toe. So GEN stands for general. H-E-E-N-T stands for head, ear, eyes, nose, and throat. And with general, um, just to go back to that, you're kind of just looking at the patient. Um, how do they appear? Do they appear a stated age? Um, do they appear to be in any you know, acute distress? Um, do they appear drowsy? Like, how do they look to you, basically? That's what that means. And then H-E-E-N-T is looking at, you know, do you see any signs of trauma on their head? Um, is it normal cephalic, atraumatic? Uh, ears and eyes, um, ears, do you see any signs of like hemotympanum or blood on their ears? Um, eyes, are their pupils constricted? Is it round and reactive to light and accommodation? Nose, you see any signs of trauma, bleeding from the nose, soot around the nose. Same thing, throat, do you see any sit around their nose? Is their tongue um, hanging out their mouth? What, what do you see? So those are things you want to really clue in for, um, for different you know, uh, diagnoses associated with ultra mental status. Neck, is there any lymphadenopathy, any JVD? Heart, you want to listen to you know, the rate, um, the rhythm. Um, you know, do you also hear like an S3, S4? Are their heart sounds muffled? These are things you want to take note of. Lungs, we talked about that earlier. Um, how are their breath sounds? Are they retracting or having accessory muscle use? Um, walls, wrong guy. Coarse breath sounds. Could be pneumonia in an elderly person causing ultra mental status. Their abdomen, is it soft, firm, rigid? Uh, you know, do they have any tenderness? And if you are able to talk to them, they're able to communicate with you, the patient, when you distract them, like talking to them about, you know, how is their day or what is their favorite food, whatever. Are they still tender when you palpate their belly? Really distracting them is really good to elicit if they're truly tender or not. And um, doing some of those other signs that you'll learn about in other videos, like Murphy's sign, assessing for Rothstein's sign, McBurney's point, things like that. G-rectal, um, you know, it's important with altered mental status patients, you know, they might not be able to give you consent. And if it's actually, you know, needed, that is an exam you want to do, have a chaperone in the room. And if there is someone who's able to give you consent, have them give you consent for that exam. But it's sometimes more important if you're worried about like infection or um, other uh, issues that might be causing their altered mental status. And then it's very important to enroll the patient. Usually you'll be part of the team for that. To look at their back, any signs of trauma, um, any rashes, ecchymosis, anything that can help clue you in and get you a better exam. Uh, neuro is the crux of the altered mental status patient's exam. You really got to assess, I always like to assess, uh, you know, their, uh, their alertness and orientation. So are they AO times three to person, place, and time? And also you want to know, that, do they follow simple commands? Um, if you can do a cranial nerve exam, two through 12, you want to assess that. Motor function, sensation, 
reflexes, cerebellar function, finger to nose, heel to shin. You want to look at their rhombergs and their gait. Uh, obviously, you won't be able to do this for all patients, but I think in these patients, as much as you can do for a neurological exam, it really will help you. And it's really important to compare what you know to their baseline. So if they're learning oriented times one, let's say to just person on your exam, and you have a family member telling you at their baseline, their AO times three to person, place, and time, that's something to note, especially in what you're attending and your team and your senior residents know. Um, because that's a, obviously an alter from their baseline. I also want to look at their extremities um, to see, you know, is there any clonus going on? Is this like a serotonin syndrome? Um, any rigidity or anything about NMS? Uh, their skin, you know, rashes. Uh, you have to think of especially hematological disorders that cause uh, rash and different things like that, or um, petechiae, purpura, you know, TTP, all these things. These are things you want to note. Um, you know, skin, uh, lymph exam and psych. Psych, you know, is their mood normal or is their mood kind of develop like a blunt affect? These are things you'd want to know. Are they um, having an acute psychotic episode? And that's why they're altered. These are all things you want to note in your exam and make sure that you um, discuss, especially during the presentation to your attending or senior residents. So when I'm thinking of my plan now, uh, after I do my H&P and I have the vitals, I definitely always, I made the, this mnemonic I call Lyme, and I always want to make sure I'm getting everything that I need to get, you know, possible in my plan so I can help figure out what's going on with the patient. So labs, you don't want to forget your point of care studies. Like I said, your finger sick blood glucose, um, sometimes a point of care um, blood gas will be helpful depending on what you're looking for. So just some, we have something like a, a we call it a general ultramental status workup, and I'll discuss that with you shortly, but making sure those labs that you order anything you might need for this patient, uh, that's really important imaging. Don't forget your EKG if it's necessary. And a lot of ultramental status patients, I would always probably order an EKG on them if I'm concerned about any arrhythmias um, or toxidromes that might cause arrhythmias, um, things like that. Uh, medications, it's really important to know, like, do you need to treat them? So once again, like, don't, that encompasses certain medications you might want to use for a patient's or ultramental status. So just keep in mind, um, and if their patient, if the patient is showing you any signs of pain, you don't want to forget to address their pain as well. And then everything else, including like frequent reassessments, that's where you as the med student would come in and often go back and check the patient and make sure they're not decompensating um, or becoming unstable. And you always want to anticipate uh, if this patient might become unstable. So that's someone you want to check more frequently than another patient, right? So a general ultramental status workup that a lot of times we'll do for patients, um, it'll include labs, obviously, like a CBC. You want to see how this, how's their white count, um, their hemoglobin. You also want to look at uh, their chemistry, so electrolytes. A lot of times I might do a CMP, so it's the uh, Complete metabolic panel, which is the basic metabolic panel plus liver function tests, um, especially if you're concerned about someone with hepatic encephalopathy, you'd want to see their liver enzymes. And for a patient like that who might have a history of cirrhosis or alcohol abuse, you might also want to get pneumonia level. If you're thinking about um, if do they have like asterisks on exam, um, things like that, you might also want to check their ammonia level for hepatic encephalopathy. Definitely an alcohol level, um, maybe a CPK to see if, you know, this patient, maybe do they use PCP? Are they now in rhabdo because they're also very um, agitated? Uh, definitely your analysis. So a lot of times urinary tract infections can present as uh, ultra mental status in elderly patients. So you always want to check your urinalysis. And then of course, a urine tox, a DAU8. It's kind of controversial, but if you're not sure, maybe you know, drugs could be the reason why um, the patient might be altered. So I would check in that case, like a DAU8 for an undifferentiated ultra mental status patient. Um, if you're worried about DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, you can check a serum osmol as well, and obviously a blood gas um, and a beta hydroxybutyrate. And then some of the imaging, like I said, I would do an EKG, typically a chest x-ray, make sure there's nothing going on, you know, pneumothorax, pneumonia, a CT head without contrast, a C, is it a tumor, 
um, is infection. Um, if it's the patient that you might be concerned with meningitis and they, you know, you don't have another reason why you might want to do the CT head uh, before that lumbar puncture. And if you're doing lumbar puncture, don't forget to order your CSF studies. Um, medications, like I said, if the patient is showing any signs of pain, then you would want to address that. But the patients also, if they're altered and they are um, a danger to themselves or a danger to their care or other people, you might need to sedate them. You can use physical restraints, um, four-point restraints, mittens, gloves, uh, um, arm restraints, things like that. Or you can use chemical restraints with sedation. So that would be things like benzodiazepines, like Ativan, Versed. Um, sometimes people use Haldol, ketamine, propofol, things to sedate them just a little bit so you can, um, they're not a danger to themselves or others. And then everything else, like I said, frequent reassessments and, and things like that. And that's where you can shine on the team. And then, like I said, you have to have a very broad differential of these patients and narrow it as you go down with your history and physical and as your, your tests come back. But um, key is always having like a one-liner with the patient demographics, the pertinent vitals, and the history and physical to create a differential of the most likely, the life-threatening, and those zebra diagnoses. So a lot of times you'll hear, uh, you know, the attending say, what do you think is most likely going on? And uh, or they might say like, what is something you can't miss? Like this could kill the patient. So, you know, what are those diagnoses that it could be that are life-threatening? And then the zebra, the rare diagnosis, like you've read about this and, you know, or when you were studying for step one, but you've never seen it or heard anyone who's seen it. Those kind of, those are the ways you want to categorize your, um, your diagnoses and your, your differential diagnoses. But one more thing to um, consider, and a lot of times, this is like a well-known mnemonic within um, ultra mental status workup, is AEIOU tips. And that is just a very large differential for you to always kind of think about, okay, this patient's ultra mental status, could it be one of these diagnoses? And you'll see different variations of AEIOU tips on Google and wherever in your studies, but um, we can just refer to this one for today, but obviously look up more for yourself. But this one basically says like for A, it could be alcohol, acidosis, ammonia, arrhythmias, endocrine, electrolytes, encephalopathy or confusion, uh, infection, oxygen, hypoxia, overdose, opioids, uremia, if it's a uh, patient with ESRD on dialysis and they've missed three weeks, they might almost have like salt, what looks like salt on their skin and be confused and it could be uremia. Uh, trauma, uh, hypo or hyperthermia, thiamine, we talked about that earlier. Um, it could be related to hypo or hyperglycemia, uh, poisoning, any kind of tox, uh, psychiatric illness, stroke, seizures, syncope, space occupying lesion or tumor, um, or shunt, VP malformation, or sorry, malfunction. So it's really important to have that broad differential and narrow it down with your history and physical and your blood work as it comes back in your imaging. But you want to also consider the patient's socioeconomic factors. Uh, where was this patient found pre-hospital? Where do they live? Uh, what is their housing status? Are they undomiciled? Um, are they around a lot of other people? Do they live in a dorm? You think about meningitis, like I said. Um, what are the living exposures? Are they, you know, living in a very old building and could it potentially be carbon dioxide uh, poisoning? you wanna consider and ask and don't assume questions about their personal background. And as we discussed earlier, it's really important to obtain that collateral information from EMS, uh, friends and family, uh, social work, if you can, because if it's a patient coming in with ultra mental status, they might not be able to give you that much information. And a pro tip to Sean in the EM rotations, like I said, helping to address the patient for their exams, uh, helping to perform a point of care ultrasound, obtaining IV access, collecting labs, bringing the labs to the lab, making sure it gets in process, uh, speaking to all these other people for collateral information. So in summary, uh, you always wanna assess the patient's primary survey. Is this patient sick or not sick? Uh, if they're sick and unstable, 
uh, address the ABCs immediately and use the don't mnemonic, dextrose, oxygen, Narcan, thiamine, to see how maybe you can uh, address this patient's um, instability and stabilize them. Um, use the patient's one-liner and elements of their history and physical exam to generate a broad differential for patients with altered mental status. And be cognizant of your own biases and maybe the biases of your teammates on, on shift so that you manage and treat each patient holistically. These are my references. Please feel free to take a picture of this and look it up online for more information. These are additional resources that you can use to learn more about patients with altered mental status um, and things that we discussed in this presentation. So, the American Psychological Association has a nice position statement on excited delirium that you can read. Um, I love telling medical students and interns, especially to Google um, MRS five minute patient presentation. It really gives you a nice way to really um, synthesize the information to a nice five minute succinct ED presentation that you know attendings like me want to hear on shift. That we so we know that you know what you're talking about and telling us what's pertinent, but not giving us a lot of extraneous information. It's good to know all that information, but you don't always need to present everything unless we ask you. And then Flip Classroom has a great, um, a great uh, topic about oral presentations in emergency medicine. So this is my contact information. Once again, my name is Valerie Pierre. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, you can see my email. You can also reach me on Twitter and I'm also on LinkedIn. Thank you guys.